Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for the Microsoft Reactor Cloud Skills Challenge Office Hour. This is our fourth and final office hour. The challenge does end tomorrow, but you still have about a day and a half um, to get started or to finish any of the learning paths. We have two learning paths. We have the DevOps one and then an Azure sampler pack path as well. And I will be putting the links for both of those in the live event Q&A. The live event Q&A is also where you can ask your questions for Randy and Ryan today. And to find that, you should see an icon that is two text boxes and the top text box has a question mark in it. Um, if you click on that, it should bring up the live event Q&A. And as I mentioned, that's where you can ask your questions and where we'll also be sharing some important links. And I will share the links to both challenges as well in case you haven't had a chance to sign up yet. Randy and Ryan are going to give um, a brief presentation today, but feel free to start asking questions and then they will answer um, answer those as well. Thank you so much. And Randy and Ryan, I will hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I, I guess I'll start uh, intro. My name is Randy Pagels. I am an Azure App Dev Specialist. I am based out of Detroit, Michigan. I've been with Microsoft almost 15 years now, um, and my mo my main focus has been around application development. So uh, today, I know I'm, uh, myself and Ryan will cover two of the topics, the uh, instrumentation strategy we'll talk through, and also the continuous integration strategy. So I do have a short slide, a uh, couple slides on both, and I plan on throwing, going through some demos as well. And Ryan, I'll turn this over to you to introduce yourself. Sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Ryan Berry. I'm also happen to be in the Detroit, Michigan area. I work very closely with Randy. And uh, my role is uh, here at Microsoft as a cloud solution architect. I've been here for um, for about 14 years now and primarily working with customers in the uh, application development in IoT spaces. And uh, you know, more recently as a CSA, I work with customers such as yourselves when you're exploring projects and initiatives that make use of our cloud capabilities. So you know, pursuing the application development technologies in, in that angle and that light. Excellent. Uh, I did want to ask uh, Dion, as far as uh, sharing my screen or whatnot, do I need to get control of this or? Oh, if you can share your screen and then control the slides and it will just override what I'm sharing right now. OK. I will do that. You should just be able to do share content. Uh, why am I not seeing this? Right next to leave. You're not seeing that with the, the, the camera, the microphone. Yep. It's uh, coming up now. OK. Sorry for the delay here. Oh. Let me know when you can see that before I start. Yep, we can see it. Excellent. So my again, my plan is to go through a short presentation on instrumentation uh, strategy, one of the these products called Application Insights. It's also on the exam. Um, in fact, that exam is this, the AZ400, which since this is the first session, this is, should not be new information. Uh, part of the exam that both Ryan and I have taken, the AZ400 is covering about, it says about five, 10%. There's a few questions on, on this as well. So I put a link down for the, the Microsoft Learning Path. Uh, big fan of that. You also see the experience points in the upper right hand corner. Always good to, uh, to run through these challenges and challenge your, your teammates. So let's just jump right into this. Um, I want to just take a step back. When you're talking about monitoring instrumentation and you're running uh, applications in Azure, Azure monitor is, an, um, think of it as a large umbrella term for collecting uh, information about pretty much everything running in Azure, really. Um, we store 
We store information in what we call a common store for metrics and logs, which now allows you to do advanced diagnostics and get some insights on that data. You can also incorporate that in some, some workflow. I plan on touching on what that looks like from a DevOps standpoint on how you can integrate this. So hang tight on that. Uh, going down one click deeper, again, Azure Monitor is overarching monitoring service for Azure. And what we can do is monitor your application, which is what we're really talking about here. We want to, you know, from an app dev world, we want to monitor the application, operating system, uh, any infrastructure it's running on, any resources, et cetera. And from there, we can get some insights, right? We can do a bunch of things with the data we're coming through. One of those key things that I'm going to talk about is this application insights, which is in the red here. Uh, beyond that, as you can see, there's many other things we can do as well. So we can monitor uh, containers and virtual machines, present dashboards, which you'll see a, a short demo of today. Uh, we could export that data and slice and dice it through Power BI if we want. We can mix and match uh, metrics, explore log analytics, send some uh, set some alerts up to respond to those alerts, auto scale up and down, et cetera. There's a, a lot of things you can do with that data when you get it. But application insights is really specific to app dev teams that want to look at failures or exceptions and performance and logs and diagnose information about their application. It, well, one one thing on the on the left side, Randy, that, that I know is sometimes confusing to customers I, I talk to, particularly when they're new to Azure or they read documentation. We have a lot of monitoring capabilities in Azure, and they've changed names over time, uh, called OMS Operations Management Suite, and then there was Log Analytics. Um, you know, everything just is under this Azure Monitor umbrella, and, and honestly, it was done to simplify things for our customers, to make it easy for them to understand from a cost standpoint that you know any bit of logging telemetry, whether it's from an application, whether it's from infrastructure, whether it's from infrastructure in another cloud, whether it's from infrastructure on-prem, um, is just data that, that we capture in this repository. Repository is a log analytics workspace. And that is the, the um, you know, the the dumping ground, if you will, of all of that log telemetry. But we have a number of different vehicles, such as application insights, um, that you can use to be able to feed that uh, that workspace. I just wanted to clarify that because that, that is something that sometimes gets confusing from from customers. Excellent, thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. it goes without saying, jump in wherever ever you want. All right. I I may forget other things. <laughs> <laughs> So looking at application insights specifically, look at these, I like to look at this as like three or four different areas, uh, gaining visibility into your, you know, the big picture, the performance, the exceptions, failures, the, the application map itself. So what components are talking and communicating with other components in the system itself? Uh, where, when are we doing deployments? If you're, if you're, in, you're automating your deployments, which is part of the next section, uh, where, what does that look like? And then from there allows you to find and fix problems in the application especially running .NET applications, et cetera. We do support many different languages, so I won't go into all those here, but let's just talk about .NET because that's what I'm going to actually demo. Um, and then integrate into your pipelines, which will fold nicely into the CI CD pipeline area to, uh, I, I like to call it markers, putting markers into deployments into the application insights logs. And of course, from there, we can monitor our websites, optimize, measure, learn, et cetera, and then we lather, rinse, repeat. So these are just, this is just an example of a dashboard you can uh, create. And then what I like to call is continuous monitoring, which is part of, think of this as part of your DevOps suite. So from Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, right? If we're, if we're using the Azure DevOps services or GitHub, uh, there's ways to, you want this continuous, you know, uh, build, check-in code, test, deploy, operate, and then monitor and learn. And this is just a repetitive cycle that we go through. Okay. so. One thing I will be diving a little deeper into is, uh, to me, the first place to start with application insights and monitoring instrumentation is this thing called an application map. It's part of the application insights area. I'll show you this in just a couple of minutes. But think of this as a high level, big picture, full app topology across uh, all the different components in your application. So if you're you're running, uh, let's say you're running an app on a website calling functions, it'll measure uh, the different calls and, and performance and failures across these calls, running into databases, running into, uh, let's say, Azure storage or blob storage. This example, lower right corners showing uh, Redis cache uh, as well. So it really is a great way to start. And this is a very active, deep linked type of a, a map. So I can click and look at uh, and analyze different areas. So 
Again, failures, exceptions, performance issues you might be looking for. How many people are using this and when are they using it? What time of day are they using it? Right? I can set up alerts that if I get too many failures or my website's not performing well enough to alert me. And then if you're using Visual Studio, there's a deep dive, uh, deep analysis of the profiler itself. So now we can measure the performance of our individual method calls. And it's called a profiler. It's part of the uh, part of it. And also the snapshot debugging. So I can actually, if I find a failure, I can click on the red, you know, right? find a failure. Uh, right inside of App Insights, there's a button that says, hey, download this snapshot debugging and throw it into Visual Studio Enterprise. And now I have that rich telemetry on my local, wherever my local copy of, of Visual Studio is. Yep, and uh, just a couple of points on that too, that, that Application Insights works with applications, again, irregardless of where they run. They can be in your own data center and another cloud. It could be a Windows desktop application. Um, doesn't have to be a, a web application or certainly one hosted in Azure. And also the, you know, one of the things about alerts that is I think really interesting and a powerful feature of App Insights is that um, sometimes you don't know what to set an alert on. And one of the things it can show or it can do, which is kind of depicted on this diagram, is you know, call between ACB front end and the authentication layer that there are a number of those calls that are, are um, not necessarily failing, but the, the time to respond is increasing. It is called out there showing roughly 125 milliseconds across those calls. And it would actually learn behaviorally what's normal and notify you when things start trending and deviating outside of normal. So that's a really powerful feature when you don't know yourself when you deploy an application what to set an alert on. It will, it will learn what to alert you on. All right, so let me go, uh, let me go right here like this. I'm gonna just, uh, there's a bunch of places we can start, but what I wanna do is just show you uh, if you were to use Visual Studio and how, you know, wh where's the best place to start? So let's say it's Visual Studio. We create an application uh, without going through all the steps, unless there's a question on this. You have a an existing application I wanna add telemetry to. It's really as simple as going to the project inside of Visual Studio solution and right clicking on that. And then there's an add button here. You can say add application insights telemetry. What that will do is install all the different NuGet packages it needs. In fact, we can go ahead and do that. It will load up the proper uh, NuGet packages for this version. I'm happen to be using .NET 5, and we want to select the Azure application insights. So the application insights instrumentation needs line of sight or needs connectivity to Azure to collect the, the telemetry here. So I'll just say next. Of course, it's going to log in with my subscription since I'm already logged in, you know, um, and then I can pick, let's say, pick the application insight, insights instance that I've created. So I've created one called reactor.net5. This is that .net5 uh, application, web app, and basically saying, where do you want to, where do you want to collect the telemetry? Important note, and I get questions on this all the time. If I have multiple components for my application running, do I log all that data into one single instance of application insights? And my answer to that is always always collect telemetry across like components for your app. When you want to report on it, you want to bubble it up to the top. You want to you know, aggregate all that data to look at the end to end operation of the app. You wouldn't you would not want to create individual application insights. And I'll show you a, a, a larger example of that in just a second here. So once I select that, it's going to connect, uh, set up a connection string. And it's going to confirm these are the things I'm going to collect. I'm going to install the, uh, you know, uh, NuGet packages, et cetera. Say, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And away it goes. So now, of course, ideally, you have this in source control. I check this back in a source control. And when it gets deployed out to a shared environment, it would automatically uh, start sending telemetry over to uh, Azure Application Insights. Generally, it's five, 10 minutes, you'll, you'll start seeing data. So that said, let me jump over. Um, let me go to a different version of Visual Studio here to show you something else. So I do have an application. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Ryan. Go ahead. So, yeah, so, so you can add this to uh, an application. Um, obviously, you're doing it through code through the project, but I, I've had customers use this with commercial products they purchased. By um, so, so we have some uh, some no code ways to be able to instrument an application as well um, as as adding you know references to to the app, application insights packages and so forth. So there. Some richer telemetry for sure when you embed it as part of your project, but, but that's not a requirement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
something else that uh, so the the next app, I'm going to show you this actual dashboard inside of Azure, of course. But before I do that, I wanted to show that, hey, if you're a developer, your head's down, you may not go to the portal. You may not go to a different area. Um, let's say I have. Uh, I have application insights installed on this app called Mercury Health and uh, one thing that we haven't mentioned yet is you can collect custom telemetry as well. Out of the box, you'll get a lot of information, but you can also go ahead and add in, in, uh, additional custom um, telemetry. For instance, cloning the IP address here, I can go ahead and add that. I can add the app version. So I pull it out of the DLL and I can actually inject that into the app insights as it's running. And also, uh, then, then it's, very in, it's very easy to instantiate the telemetry component and wherever you want where anywhere in your code all I need to do is say track the event and what's cool is it gets injected with a label and then whatever data you want and it just becomes part of all that data you'll see up in app insights which I'll show you in just a minute so keep that in mind the last thing I'll show you from Visual Studio is you can of course you get a lot you can pull uh, that data down from Azure into Visual Studio itself so here I can slice and dice it. You'll see in the left hand side the different uh, all the different uh, uh, components and telemetry that collect uh, gets collected. I talked about application version. So when I show you a CI CD, I'm taking my app version and, and inserting it into application insights so I can actually split which version maybe cause different problems. Um, I get IP addresses. I can look at the cities it's running from, etc. So my point is all this data is, is collected here. I, um, inside of you know it's just pulling it down you can see i can connect to any other instance but just keep that in mind i can go ahead and look for different uh, uh, pieces of information from visual studio but any comments got ryan or shall i go look at the portal now no, let's, let's go check out the portal let's go check out the portal ryan will have lots to say about the portal <laughs> so I'm in Azure, the portal itself uh, there's many different ways to to start you know with with Azure of course one thing is uh, I wanted to say if I went to the home page here and said, hey, give me a new resource application insight that you could do it this way as well. If you have an existing, you know, you want to create the application insights first, do it here. I want to create a web app. I could do that and add app insights. Um, I could use Visual Studio. There's, there's probably six different ways to do this, but I would create that right here. Once it's created, you'll come over to the blade, which is the application uh, insights blade. Uh, this is that map that we showed you a picture of, but it's very interactive, right? So I have some uh, in this example, I have some functions that are clearly failing about 9% of the time. Uh, 244 millisecond calls into my .NET app on my uh, API layer, which then calls out to the web service layer, which calls out to a database layer. Some of the APIs go on site, go off site. I go out to the USDA gov site. So here I can go ahead and start mapping these things. But let's say I want to see why these calls are failing here to the website. What's cool is I can just click into it and it'll go through using some machine learning to uh, let's say aggregate this information together and we can look at I can just drive, you know, dive right into investigate the failures, look at the performance, etc. So that's the map. Uh, I want to show you another thing on the left hand side. If you want to just jump into failures itself, all these blades work very similar where I can actually pick the time window. So let's say I want to look at all my failures for the last 30 days. And this is my slice of time. It also looks at the, uh, on the right here, I'll show you the top three failing codes, top three exception types. So I'm getting some invalid operations. I'm getting some 404s. I'm getting some SQL uh, errors as well on the home page. The one thing I want to bring your attention to is the notice the markers, these blue markers at the top. This is part of the CICD process that we'll cover kind of next the next topic to insert these markers into your application insight data so that at any point in time I can see, you know, hey, I deployed this app and bam, I have this marker sitting here right at a bump on a one of the failures. So perhaps one of my deployments had some component that was wrong or, or whatnot. And when I click it, it will tell me where it came from. This is a really powerful feature when you think about the challenges when it, when it come in, into play when it uh, comes to identifying and, you know, what the causes of a failure. Uh, you know, obviously, this this is really clear when you can see here that there's probably a. Did we lose you, Ryan?
Hey, Ryan. Now, Deanne, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, it sounds like we lost. OK, lost Ryan, maybe I'm sure he'll be back. <laughs> OK, I'm sure I'm sure he'll be back. I, I wanted to make sure you didn't lose me, so OK. okay thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to go. Let's see. Uh, so failure blade works this way. If I wanted to drill into any of these failures, I would just go through and look at the operations. This is what I would do from some of the apps I have. Um, and again, this is this is part of the application insights that's using another service called machine learning to comb through these thousands and tens of thousands of different uh, points of telemetry. And it actually suggests that if you're going to start somewhere, we'd suggest you start here. And what we'll we'll give you is this end-to-end -end transaction, depending if it's an API call, if it's a database call, if it's a, a service API call offsite, you'll get this nice end-to-end -end transaction. And uh, in this particular call, something's going on with the uh, SQL Server connection. So probably a bad a bad example here, but the idea is I can go ahead and get an end-to-end -end transaction uh, on, on this. Let me go back. I'm missing my uh, interesting. Turning it back to your main blade. I'm back by the way. I yeah, uh, yeah. You're, well, team you're team <laughs> there the the bar is uh is not there for me for some reason i don't know what what's going on here but anyway um i i showed you investigating failures or uh, in, on the failure blade there's also the idea of performance issues so i can look at what's the slowest performing component of your app these blades this this uh these uh these areas that are working very similar to that um like before also uh uh, as far as the failure blade, you can also actually grab these markers and, and go like this and zoom right into a specific area. So I always found that to be pretty cool. Also notice the marker at the top. It's, again, here's a marker here. When I click that, I can see when it was launched, what build number it is, what when it was deployed, etc. So that's very similar. Um, another, and these are just some of my favorite features. Ryan, I'm happy to, to jump in on any other things you might have. Ryan talked about alerts, so I can set up a monitoring alert here. I, and the yeah, the smart detection is what I was talking about, which is the uh, um, kind of the AI based. So, but this is this is a good example. This is actually over the past week, and it's showing that get request to this REST API. Um, you know, it, it's is typically uh, less than a second, and that there was an increase in the response time over, over the last seven days, and it you know identifying how many users are impaired by that. So this is where um, you know, you, you could certainly set a alert yourself around this, but you might not know to set an alert around a Git operation against a particular uh, endpoint that you have in your application. And this will actually alert you to something that is likely abnormal. Right, and it comes with settings and time ranges as well. Correct. Yeah. So that's that's a nice feature as well. Um, let's go back to. Another feature called live metrics. So this is something that our uh, our product group uses for DevOps to have a they have a, a, a monitor on their board on their in their team rooms to monitor the operations of the actual product called Azure DevOps. But what this is allowing basically allow you to look to look at live telemetry going into the application insights instance. And, and you'll complete with failures and whatnot. So this is this is all live happening now. And it's also nice if you're scaling out, let's say Azure Functions or not, you'll see the instances in the servers down below what's actually being used. Every component of your app will show up here. So this is something to definitely go look at or play around with. And um, also one more, couple more things on the left here. If you go down, so we looked at uh, monitoring, we looked at investigating. I think this transaction search is pretty cool too. Let's say, uh, I'll, I'll say same thing, three days worth. Let's just grab that. What's cool is I can look at what's been happening. What kind of transactions have I had in the last uh, three weeks or three days or you know, whatever you wanted to pick? And this is similar to what I showed you in Visual Studio, except it's in the portal. And I can go through each individual call if I want. Here's a custom event. This is a custom event. Ba basically, I'm, I'm inserting uh, data through an API and I can actually look at that. Sorry about that. This uh, had to go back there, my bad. Um, and again, custom event is in yellow or orange or green, whatever color that happens to be. 
and this is a this is what I call this is what again this is a custom insert. Um, and then you can also look at it by the long list of results, but I like to use the, the grouped results. So now I can group these like common things together and see what the percentages are. So right, the common properties properties. So keep that in mind when you play around with this as well. And the other piece I'll show you app app insights and we'll uh, move on. Unless there's questions, but as users, so who's using it, right? The number of users. Now, this is just a demo demo application, so it doesn't really have a lot of users. Users, but um, same sort of thing. I can go again. Everything's time sliced. How many users are hitting this application across? Uh, you know, whatever three days worth. Uh, what's nice, I, I think, is is the button called View In More Insights. So if I want to see which operating systems, what countries someone's hitting this from, what browsers are they using? Just your typical usage, right? Uh, that's what this is. So this also show details on user flows and retention um, in um, in the, the funnels is also pretty interesting, but user flows is, a, is powerful. When you think about, let's say an e-commerce site, because it's easy to talk about, everybody has used one of those, um, that if you make a change maybe to your checkout process and add another page into the or step into the mix. Um, you can actually see, you know, are, are users getting to that point and then running away? You know, are you introducing something into your application that's making the users leave after they, they do do something? Or or um, or maybe you want to understand, you know, what's the typical entry point for customers? You know, are they hitting product search page and then going to checkout or um, so this, this will give you some insight into what those those patterns are to your users. And you can also do things to be able to do some A/B type testing where you can, you know, make some changes to your application and be able to see behaviorally, you know, if it's in increasing uh, or decreasing the the uh, retention rate of users to your application. Thank you. And there's a uh, there's a lot of other things we could cover. There's not enough time uh, today to, to cover all these things, but I, I would encourage you to go play around with this a little bit. Um, last question I usually get is, well, how much data can I collect? Right? I get that question a lot. If you go under usage and estimated costs, this will show you how much or show me on this on my example how many megs of data I'm actually collecting and by which day. So it breaks it down nicely. Uh, the one thing I'll point out is at the very top is we call it data sampling. Um, uh, it's recommended to start at 50%. Right, every other transaction gets collected. That's probably usually enough to get a pulse on your application. Uh, but the point is, you can actually change the amount of data that's coming into the the log files. Uh, also, retention. I don't think this is what Ryan was talking about retention, but as far as how much data do we, you know, to retain, ninety days is the default. Yep, and, and then, data sam yeah, data sampling. You can also configure that at the application level. Where, and, and by that I mean in the config file for your for your uh, when you add application insights, they so can do things like saying I want to capture all errors, but maybe only put some, uh, you know, periodic sampling of uh, successful requests. So you can have very you have a lot of knobs you can use to be able to control the amount of data that gets pushed up. Excellent. And then of course the daily cap. So I collect 100 gig a day. I get an email. If I if I want to set this up to send me an email, I get I can look at that. All right. We check for uh, questions, Ryan, or? No. Nope. Shall no I switch questions. gears? OK, no questions. I'll switch gears and let's go back to the slides. Um, like this. In the slide deck, I put some basic getting started with application insights links, but by by you know far is start with the ms learn that we started with that's probably the best place there's a link here as well so in the slide deck uh, i know this is the last session probably not a lot of time but the next area we are going to talk about and have some fun with same same sort of style is the implement the continuous integration same uh, area same exam it's more it's a little heavier weighted so it's 20 to 25 percent not 10 percent there's many more questions about ci cd here uh, you'll you'll get on the exam. So again, these are I'm sure you're well aware of this, but here it is. One thing I like to start out is just high level. Just a couple of slides on, on how Microsoft uses CI CD. Again, at Microsoft, we build a lot of products. We have a lot of continuous integration, continuous deployments. Even Azure DevOps itself is deployed about seven times a day through uh, uh, through controlled. The, we call it exposure through uh, through deployment rings. 
but just just give you some ideas of how many deployments we run. You know, 82,000 deployments a day. Um, a lot of employees, 110,000 engineers are, are using the product, and we're not just building DevOps. They're building Windows 10. They're building a bunch of other things. This is kind of give you an idea. Um, Visual Studio, you know, one of my favorites, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, The Office, Xbox Live, Windows itself, huge team doing using this as well. Um, the Bing team, Minecraft, just to name a few. But I just want to just emphasize that we use what we build for our own CI CD deployments. Okay. Uh, we also use a lot of the teams now we use release flow, so we're using Git source control. Uh, that could be in Azure repos, that could be in GitHub, but we're using the Git technology. And the idea is we we uh, we use topic branches across above our master branches, and this is where we deploy from. So just high level. Um, also important to know is pull requests. So this is where we can do code reviews across the teams. This is where we can, uh, uh, you probably heard the term shift left testing. So get that testing prior to merging code into master. So we use pull requests for that. Uh, Failures are much are, are very few and far between now because of using pull requests because things get built prior to merging code. So just keep that in mind. Pull requests are important in running tests. Again, Microsoft, we're a huge uh, proponent of running tests. You'll see we run like 70 uh, this in this example of 78,000 tests per check in per pull request. So we bang on it pretty hard for running tests on, on all code that gets merged to master. Masters are gold, our gold copy for deployments. Also, one last concept we use is green means green, red means red. Uh, if our, if any single test, if a single unit test fails, it is considered a uh, not a healthy build and we will not release it. So we keep track of that on these dashboards. If you're using anything with Azure DevOps, you'll see these dashboards as well. And then the, the other last concept I want to land here before we jump out and show you a few things is the uh, idea of that your aim won't be perfect. Uh, control the blast radius. So we're we're probably all used to deployments and something goes wrong and you get texted, you get, you know, you get woke up in the middle of the night to fix something. Ideas control the blast radius. So how do you move changes through the deployment rings? We, we at Microsoft, we, you know, we have our CI, which is our continuous integration. We're checking code in, we're, we're doing code scans, security scans, malware scans, right? Things get triggered either by code change or maybe a schedule, depends on who you are. And we and our our first ring is called a canary ring, and our first ring is Redmond. All Redmond engineers get the first deployment. That way, our customers aren't seeing it, but yet our own engineers are our own customers for some of these things. Then we have another ring for early adopters and users, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's what we call the blast radius. And, and the idea is each ring. Let's call these rings. There's I think seven of them. Each one bakes for 24 to 48 hours, depending on the change. If it's if things are, uh, are successful and pass, it moves to the next ring. So what do we get with this? We call it a progressive exposure. We deploy one stage at a time. We use release gates or quality gates, as we call them. And what what you're seeing here is a CI is on the left. So we've built our product. Now we have our binaries. We're deploying out to these stages. This was just done yesterday. Uh, this is live. Was live. What's a screenshot of a live? And each one of these uh, areas can have manual approvers, automated approvals, uh, automated gates, so we can do some automatic checking. We've talked about doing these, uh, creating these alerts in Azure. So if you create an alert from the DevOps process, from the re, you know the CI/CD process, I can tap into those alerts, read them from Azure, and decide whether I should proceed forward or not. That's how we automate our builds, and we, that's how we can do so many a day. You know, we don't have enough time or people to manually approve these as we go so we automate some of those different things. So what do we get from that? We get awesome visibility in, in any impact across these different rings. Our canary rings Redmond, then different data centers. We have the US as a data center. We have uh, uh, South America, I think is one of our data centers. Europe's is one of our data centers. So we, we go across these rings and in the end we can go back and look at what was the ring, you know, ring zero through ring seven. So uh, yes, I mean, sorry, ring six. So there's seven rings, and this is just one small example of actual uh, deployments of Azure DevOps. Now, the Windows team and different teams do it differently, but the core concept's the same as they use the ring approach. So, right? Uh, yes. Somebody, uh, so a couple of things I'll chime in with. Um, you know, first of all, you know, somebody asked what the pricing model was for application insights, and that's where I was talking about earlier, um, maybe that 
person might not have been on when I when I had mentioned that as well. But just to, to highlight, um, you know, we unified all of our logging under the Azure Monitor umbrella. So uh, every month there is five gigabytes of data that's included under that umbrella of logging telemetry. And that logging telemetry, as I mentioned, could be from VMs, regardless of where they happen to reside, or it could be from applications, or it could be log data from other services in Azure, such as web logs from a app service environment or uh, uh, network logs from uh, you know, a, a VPN network or a VPN gateway that you might have deployed in Azure. So those are all types of telemetry that can be captured. And because there is data associated with it, there is a cost to it. So um, that also is why there's uh, logging and diagnostic settings are always opt-in for services in Azure. You have to turn that on. Um, and if you forward it to Azure Monitor, there, it would actually be a metered event that would actually count towards that five gigabytes a month. And then um, anything beyond that is charged at uh, is like a two dollar. I can't remember the exact price. Two dollars and some change. And if you look at the Azure pricing calculator, you can see it, uh, it is, is what that that uh, data is built at. And then um, to what you were showing, I, I was going to highlight a interesting use that I had a uh, independent software vendor actually make pretty extensive use of this for deploying to um, much like we do, you know, with the Ring Zero and, and you know, kind of the early adopter customers or, um, you know, in this case, it's our product teams where this customer of mine in the financial services space uses Azure DevOps pipelines to deploy their product to um, a little bit over a thousand subscriptions right now and growing. So that's a pretty unmanageable task to be able to think about doing that with something like uh, you know, Bash scripts or, or PowerShell. So they have Azure DevOps agents deployed on every single VM across all of those subscriptions, and they can actually target them individually by customer, saying, I want to um, update customer X's environment, or I want to update all the customer, all the customers in East US. Uh, I want to deploy to all my early adopter customers. So you can do some really powerful things when it comes to um, uh, you know, some, some of the DevOps release pipelines with kind of establishing these tags and hierarchies and, and how you want to actually roll out your application. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. All right, I will go out back out to um, back out to here. So a couple of things I'll show you getting started with. Uh, one of the things we talked about back on Application Insights is how do you insert that uh, that annotation, that marker uh, in your deployment pipeline. And there's a couple ways to do this as well. We'll talk about what it, and I'll start one from scratch, but inside the deployment pipeline, there's an area here called add of the release annotation to App Insights. It's one line and you can put that anywhere in any environment you want um, and it'll go ahead and insert, insert that. This happens to be a deployment for um, a dev area, but that's I just insert the marker there. Again, it's part of a, it's just a task that you put in the task runner when you're creating these pipelines. So let's go look at the pipeline itself. If I wanted to start from scratch, let's just say, I'm, I'm using obviously demoing um, uh, Azure DevOps. I would go to pipelines itself and I could say, hey, I want to start a brand new pipeline. And I'll just touch on this ever so lightly. Uh, right, the, the world has gone YAML. So YAML is the de facto standard these days. I'll show you an example of that in a second. However, I find it much easier to get started and find customers find it a lot easier to get started. If you go to the bottom where it says use the classic editor, this is the uh, the classic editor version, right? It walks you through, hey, where's your source code? Mine's in Azure Git or uh, repos. Maybe it's in GitHub, maybe it's in Bitbucket. I can say continue and then it asks, hey, what kind of app are you building, right? It's not all about just Microsoft technologies or .NET apps. I could build Maven, Go, PHP, JavaScript, uh, .NET, Android, whatever. There's a lot of templates here uh, to build on. I'm just going to select that template because that's what the app is. If you selected YAML, it will detect the type of app based on the source code and come up with an, uh, a file uh, and a template for you. Now, this is the core of CI. This is the continuous integration piece. Uh, what you have here, the anatomy of this is you have an agent job, uh, you have a pipeline job. Notice that we're using our Azure pools. We call it an agent pool. These are hosted agents built in, you know, in Azure and Azure DevOps. Uh, 
and you can use them for you know for free up to 1800 minutes uh, you can pick any of the operating systems that we support right linux uh windows or mac are sitting here this is nice i don't have to set up anything i can just point and click right um so that's that's a nice piece pick up my azure subscription you know what app service i want to run this to etc so um I should probably get rid of that because this is part of, let me get that. I personally picked, to, you can do this any way you'd like, but personally, I like the separation of concerns. Use CI to build your app and create the binaries and uh, use any kind of security scanning you want, and then use the release piece to actually deploy the application. You could do it all in one. Uh, what you're looking at is a task runner, and the task runner puts the tasks in the right order. I can move these around if I want. I could also click the plus sign and look through a list of about seven to 800 tasks that are out here. We can deploy to our cloud or any other cloud. We can deploy to on-prem. We can deploy different code pieces. There's PowerShell, there's command line. Uh, there's probably a task for everything you can think of here. And you just put the, you know, the Lego pieces, I call it. Put those together, snap them in order, set some properties and away you go. And these can run, Right now, you're running them on a node that gets provisioned automatically in Azure. But in a customer example, I was highlighting you know, that customer chose because they were deploying infrastructure as part of their application deployment. You can deploy the agent onto any machine, regardless of where it is. It doesn't have to be in the cloud. It can be in other clouds or on-premises. And you can remotely control that and target those environments with these tasks. So, you know, that's uh, when you think about doing things like, uh, you know, my, my customer's example with over a thousand subscriptions, let's say they wanted to run a PowerShell script on all of those VMs, um, you know, using PowerShell remoting is a potential security vulnerability to open up a bunch of holes in the firewall that needed to, to uh, that would need to be, um, uh, you know, open to be able to allow that to work. Well, you can actually create an Azure pipeline a DevOps pipeline that actually runs a script locally in every one of those machines, and you can do it in parallel in a very firewall friendly and secure way. Excellent, Ryan. A couple other things here in the build areas. Uh, not only can you, you can set up variables you may use throughout the build process, triggers are important. So enabling continuous integration is as a mere checkbox now. Uh, it's that simple. I can also schedule builds on a certain day. And then there's a couple options here. Um, I think it's interesting that you can change the build number if you'd like. And if you're using the work item tracking piece of Azure DevOps, you want to create a work item on a failure. And I say, I want to create a bug. If something, if the build fails, create a bug and assign it to Ryan is usually what I do, so. <laughs> All right. Let me show you when that's done. So again, I'll, I'll grab the Mercury Health build. I'll show you just what one looks like after it goes through its process here. Again, everything's running on the agent, so you have full logs. These uh, every every step, every of the every one of the build items, you get a full. Uh, sorry, the task you get a full log. You can actually look at it or download the whole thing if you want. So just keep that in mind. It's all here. And then it basically on our servers, we'll we'll send the binaries to a drop location, or maybe using artifact uh, or artifactory or wherever you want to drop the binaries. You can go ahead and do that as well. Um, I wanted to show you the contrast between this pipeline. Now remember, this is a classic view. It's it's stored in Azure DevOps, but again, the modern world, a lot of you know the kind of the way of the world, the most popular field, uh, seem like technology these days is a YAML pipeline. And to be very clear, YAML pipeline, you know, YAML is stored in source control, so you version control your actual build process and deployment process right alongside the code. It it's it's really common and. Uh, I, I, that's what I see a lot of that. I don't know, Ryan, if you see a lot of that nowadays, but I do. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I, there's some other things that you can do as well when you when you make it part of your source control, and that is including being able to tokenize aspects of that YAML file and inject other aspects of automation as part of your build process. So you can do some some interesting and creative tasks when when you uh, you know have it as a unified script, if you will. And for those that haven't seen YAML, uh, again, I have some links here, but what you are what you see is this YAML pipeline is the CI CD pipeline. It's one file. It does all the building, compiling, security scanning, um, drop locations, and then it goes and deploys it through different stages. And this is what YAML looks like. It's just a markup language. You know, you put your variables up here. Um, what's cool, I can create stages. 
and I can have certain stages depend on the other stage prior to running. Um, I, and then I invoke the tasks. So I'm using white source bolt for security scanning, right? Here's the PowerShell tasks. Uh, here's the .NET Core tasks. These are just in order. Just start, you know, just starts running through these. And then if I run, go down to the bottom where the uh, deployment piece is, you'll see here the stage is deployed to dev, deployed to QA or Canary or however you want to run this. Um, I can access, let's say I'm, for my example, I deploy out to multiple databases, different connection strings. I can go ahead and I use Azure Key Vault for keeping secrets and keeping uh, encrypted uh, uh, admins and passwords, things like that. So I have act, I have the ability to you know reach back into Azure and uh, grab whatever things, I, uh, whatever information I need here. Same thing, database connections, etc. So this is in source code. It's a version controlled. Anyone making changes to it, if they have access to it, I, I can keep track of that, which is really awesome. Uh, let me just show you what it looks like. I'll just show you one that just ran. So you'll see this is uh, this is not nearly as complex as the Microsoft's build system for Azure DevOps, but um, this is the YAML version. Now you can see I, I create the CI on the left. Um, I happen to be using something called an infrastructure as code to deploy all my different infrastructure parts. So the database gets deployed, the function app gets deployed, the web app gets deployed, any DNS or any connections I happen, I, I put it all into one you know, deployment. So basically I could delete this from Azure and stand the whole thing up by just running this deployment. So very important, a whole other topic on another day. Um, and then I, I roll out to databases, of course the SQL database, the app service, the function, et cetera. I'm also doing some load and performance testing make sure that the app runs well. And then I also run some UI automation tests, so I'm using Selenium for that. Uh, again, you can build this however you like, but this is full CI CD here. Uh, one thing I do check is we talked about quality gates. So if I click on this, the checks I can see, uh, I have three different quality gates being called. I call out to some APIs, make sure they're up and running. Remember the alerts Ryan talked about? I can tap into one of my uh, Azure monitor alerts. So again, you can create thousands of different alerts. I just tap into one of these. This, this happens to check the response time of the web app that was being load tested. If it's greater than 15, mil or 15 seconds, then this fails. I, I just think uh, waiting 15 seconds for a web app would be too long. Um, and then the approval, the approval itself, and I can make up that number, but the approval itself, you can keep track of uh, the different messages or whatnot. But the point is, these are the, the the approval gates and the quality gates that are running automatically on these different stages. And this is a full blown CI CD. Ryan, anything to add to that? No, no, that's a, that's a okay. good one. Okay. Um, and this is again from here, you can launch into different things, reports, uh, and you know, uh, different pieces of the reports themselves. There's which branches are being deployed, analytics from the deployments over time, you know, what's the pass rate, failure rate, et cetera. There's, these reports are just built into Azure DevOps. So. And um, I believe, yeah, we can take any questions that might come up right now. Yeah, we've got 10 minutes left. Let's, uh, let's see, I've got none have popped into Q&A. Okay. One thing I'll show then while, we're, while we have a few extra minutes here is how fun to actually show the Microsoft engineering. If you notice the Azure DevOps URL is the Microsoft engineering instance of Azure DevOps. So I'll go into the Azure DevOps project where Azure DevOps is actually built. The very product we're using is built here. So just to show what one of their pipelines look like, hopefully we can find one running live right now. It'd be really cool. It's still kind of mind blowing when you think about it that they're using the tool to build the tool. So. <laughs> yes, yes. I see one running here. Um, Now they they have different, uh, you know, they have a different process here, so it's it's hard to say sometimes what they're actually doing. That's not a good one. That's not what I want to show you. Sorry, my bad. I wanted to go to the releases. That's what I wanted to show you. So this this one's running here. This just got kicked off. It looks like uh, a few minutes back. And remember, this is going on all the time. Let me back up a little bit here. My zoom makes this. So again, this is the uh, picture I put in the slides. But I can see if I scroll down, I can see that the ring zero at the bottom is actually processing the, the those quality gates, the automation gates are processing here before it moves on to the next rings. And that, that's in West Central US. So this is literally deploying to Azure DevOps that you all might be using right now. Yep, exactly. If I if I 
so zoom out a little. This is the progressive exposure we talked about. So hopefully everyone's sitting down when I scroll to the right here. You'll see this just this is this is why it takes many days and it bakes into the different rings. We're on ring three. I can go over to ring four. I'll let the teams update itself here. Ring five. And this is where we, this particular build ends at ring five. So it's got a long ways to go. So this is uh, again, this is an automation process for our deployments. I don't know if that's too small to read, but it almost is on my side. And again, the TFS, the prod, our prod output. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot. Th this this screen is just showing you the different deployment stages here. When they fail, again, red means red, and we stop. It 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 halts. Here's one that's queued up. Just uh, uh, this is UTC time, I believe. This is queued up. It hasn't started yet, so this is still waiting, waiting for something. No, anyway, I thought I would show you that. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say that that one looks like it was manually triggered, so it's, it's waiting probably for somebody to approve it, probably. But, yep. yeah. Here's one. Let's see how far along this one was done at uh, eight o'clock. Let's see where that which is at. Oh, well, this is made it to this is at deploying some database. So it passed ring three. It looks like right now. So. So it's interesting, uh, fun, a little fun to go in and see where you know where a current deployment is. I guess if you call that fun. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends who you are. Well, I know we have uh, just a little over five minutes left. So Ryan, anything question. else you could you could think of the show or? Not uh, not pertaining to these topics. I think you well, yeah. <laughs> probably should stay within the, the realm of the topics. <laughs> um. well, thank you both so much. Um, we probably want to give it another 30 seconds or so. We'll just make sure if anyone's trying to type in um, their last minute question. Um, but thank you again. While we are waiting a few seconds to see if some more questions come in, I will just mention that if you haven't signed up for the challenges yet, you do still have a few hours to go through them. Um, I put the links for both challenges in the live event Q&A. There is also a link to the YouTube Cloud Skills Challenge playlist um, that you can go to and see the kickoff event as well as the three other office hours. And this office hour will be uploaded there in the next 24 to 48 hours. So if you missed anything, or you want to um, re-listen to anything, there will be that will be uploaded there soon. And it looks like we have a few questions coming in, so I will publish those. Um, so the first question is: Does Microsoft do rollback in their CI slash CD pipeline? So that's an interesting question, and the when you our cloud services are incredibly complex spread across you know tens many many tens of millions of of nodes so and in many different geographies so because of that it it's a uh, it, it's not a we don't roll back because there's some uh, uh, you know potential risk involved in that depending on what the state of that particular cluster of machines is at um, you know, it, it might have it might introduce a condition that hasn't been tested or validated. So it's a roll forward strategy for for resolving issues, which is also why you saw all the different rings that you know their different environments that those builds actually flow through before they ever make it into an environment that are, is being used by by paying customers. And I see a lot of a lot of customers I work with do the similar thing. Um, you know, as, as environments become more complex and, and challenging, think about things like um, database schema changes. So you make a bunch of schema changes and then you roll out services that interact with those schema changes. And then you roll out a web application um, that uses those services. And maybe somewhere along the way, uh, you have one of your locations that fails. So now you've got all of the plumbing actually released and operations that have already occurred that have written data to your new database schema. So rolling back is is a pretty challenging operation once once you get into a state like that. All right. Um, 
And the next question is, can you help me understand the CDS subscription pricing? Help you understand the CICD pricing? Correct? Um, it said CDS, but they, yeah, it may have meant oh. the CICD, yeah. They said CDS subscription pricing. Um, I'm okay. I'm not sure what the CDS is. Is if that's what, if they're talking about CICD pricing. Um, basically, when I was showing the when you pick a hosted build server in Azure DevOps, and I'll just talk about that specific pricing. Is Microsoft gives you 1,800 build minutes and deployment minutes. It's a combined set of minutes per subscription. So if you have a an Azure DevOps subscription, you share across many different team projects. It's a shared pool of 1800 build and redeployment minutes. And those are actual build time deployment minutes. So that will depend on how often you build, how long your builds take and deploys. Uh, beyond that, you can get an unlimited, let's say build server for $40 a month. Uh, and you just add that to your account and you'll have unlimited minutes using the hosted build servers. So and we got it. Sorry, we got an nope. update from them. They were looking for the um, information on the subscription pricing for the common data service services. That's what they meant by CDS, common data services. The common data services. Ryan, are you familiar with that? Common data services. Uh, I am. I don't know what the pricing is on that. Um, I can check real quick. We can move on. I see there's another question in there too. Yeah, if you want to check on that one, I can read the next question. Okay. Um, so Kevin asked, I didn't see mention of immutable infrastructure versus configuration as a service. Is that pattern common in AZ DevOps? So uh, I will let Ryan answer the question about, well, so yes, I. You're correct, correct. I did not show uh, configuration as a service. I I only m briefly talked about infrastructure as code, which is part of my pipeline. Uh, configuration as code could be as part be part of that pipeline as well, uh, which is where you'd you'd want that, right? Uh, after the after infrastructure. So yeah, I, I agree. I, I I would encourage. So I have a couple. You, you, well, first of all, your, your answers spot on, but where I was kind of hesitating a bit, and I didn't want to say that that's necessarily a bad thing, but from my point of view, in today's world, in thinking about moving at the you know, speed of Agile, it, you know, you should maybe, um, I encourage my customers to rethink that strategy, um, and I'll give you a, a very specific example. Um, I have a customer who has a pool of compute nodes they use for processing some data analytics. And they treated it like, um, uh, you know, like pets. So you use that analogy, you know, where they, they cared and nurtured and fed these servers. They kept them up to up to date. You know, they had, I think they had almost 30 of them. It was like an odd number, 31 of them that they were maintaining. And, you know, along with that comes the old adages of patching and maintenance and keeping them all in sync. Um, and you know, they had a security incident that occurred that and it involved a uh, crypto uh, locker situation and, and uh, some storage that those machines were using, and they weren't sure what the collateral damage was. And that really prompted them to think about non-immutable infrastructure. And we, uh, we within a couple hours, created some DevOps pipelines that actually was able to rebuild that environment and, and all 31 of those machines in parallel in about five to seven minutes. So now what they do for patching, they tear down the entire environment and they rebuild it. So it you know, kind of goes from that treating it from as cattle, to, or I'm sorry, treating as pets to treating like cattle. And that allows them to very rapidly deploy into other regions if, should there be an issue in one of the primary regions they're running out of. Uh, so it has a bunch of benefits. Um, you know, so I, I don't want to say that's absolutely unnecessary these days, but it's just something I would encourage you to maybe think about a different approach if it's, if it's possible. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we are at time. Um, so 
Thank you, Ryan and Randy, for this great presentation and answering all the questions today. And thank you, everybody, for joining. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to send us those on the Meetup page. Um, and we will, I'm more than happy to follow up with Randy and Ryan and get those answers for you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.